No, we're really recording. Okay, right. Um, so folks, this is week 10 of OLS 6. Uh, it's very exciting. We're delighted to have you here today. I'm going to run through my usual announcements and then we will kick off with the call. Um, so first of all, get my place correctly in the etherpad. We are talking about knowledge dissemination and open science today. Um, and as a reminder, we have a code of conduct. Now for this code of conduct, right now on the etherpad it's line 45 you can also visit it by going to openlifesciorg slash code dash of dash conduct um this it, we would ask people to treat one another with the respect that you would like to receive um and if at any point you believe that you have either witnessed or experienced behavior that isn't in line with our code of conduct please report it to the OLS team. That can go to team at openlifesci.org, uh, which reaches myself, Berenice, Emmy, Malvika, and Paz. Or you can email any one of us individually if there's a reason that you'd rather not speak to the whole team. Um, we have an Otter AI transcript. The link for that, I believe, is on line 48. Um, that just mean, makes sure that you can follow along uh, with the, what's the words, uh, the spoken word, um, if you miss anything, or if you're hard of hearing, or if English isn't your first language, or any other reason that you might want to follow along with a transcript. Uh, when we do breakout rooms, we will also ask people to either choose written breakout rooms or spoken breakout rooms for the same reason as we have Otto. Um, Otto doesn't work in breakout rooms, so we can't provide transcription. So the other option is to use a written breakout room instead. Um, when we do that, we ask people to actually modify their name in Zoom just to say whether you prefer written or whether you prefer spoken. So um, I can do this now. I open the participants window and then I click on more and I click on rename beside my name. And then I'm going to say I would prefer written today. So I put W in front of my name. I'd be very grateful if everyone else who's here can do that. If you can't for some reason, like you're on mobile or you can't find the settings, we will probably ask you before we put you into a breakout room. OK, pause for air. <laughs> right. Um, do I have any other reminders for now? I'm going to say no. I believe we kick off with a speaker. Gemma, do you want to take it from here? Thank you, Yo. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks for being here. Um, our first speaker of the day is Mallory Freeberg. She'll introduce herself, but basically we'll be talking about how fair principles and how to cite different types of data, code, uh, publications, etc. So we'll have a short presentation. You have the slides on the Etherpad on line 62 as well. And feel free to drop questions in the Etherpad or in the chat. We'll have uh, time for questions after the presentation. So with that, uh, Mallory, um, please go ahead. Great, thank you. Okay, sharing slides. Um, Yes, thank you um, so much for the invitation to um, talk today um, about FAIR principles. So let's start, hopefully you can see my starting slide. Um, so my name is Mallory Freeberg, as mentioned. Um, my, my background is um, in bioinformatics from an academic um, perspective. Um, but about seven years ago, I switched from academia, studying genomics and transcriptomics, I started working with some um, open science projects, including the Galaxy Project, um, where I was a trainer um, to help um, uh, researchers use bioinformatics tools and a web-based platform. Um, and I also worked for an open project called the Human Slotless, where I was um, a metadata specialist. And uh, now I run the European Genome Phenome Archive, which is a resource for managing controlled access uh, human DNA type data. Um, so this is a resource located at the European Bioinformatics Institute, um, which is part of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. Um, and I'm physically located in Cambridge in the UK. Um, so from my experience working with data in our research, mostly in the life science context, um, I have been familiar with the FAIR principles for a while. So I'm gonna to talk today, give a bit of an overview about these principles in the context of promoting openness in science. Um, and I'll give some examples from my background, which again is sort of the genomics area, but these principles can really be applied to a variety of um, research topics. 
So uh, for those who haven't heard about FAIR, um, this is an acronym. It stands for um, Findability, Accessibility, Interoperability, and Reusability. And these are a set of principles that were first uh, published in uh, 2016. There's a link to the uh, paper on the right-hand side. So a lot of my talks will, or slides will have a lot of links um, because I am giving an overview and there's a lot of information um, that you can read up uh, on your own time about these topics. Um, and these principles were initially developed to describe how to um, how to share research data and metadata as as outputs. Um, and I'll talk about later how they've expanded to um, be applied to other research outputs. So what do we briefly mean by these principles? Um, so findability means that the outputs of your research um, are available in some sort of public repository and they are assigned. Uh, unique and persistent identifiers, also known as accessions, so they can be found easily, <laughs> pretty straightforward. Uh, for accessibility, uh, this means that the research outputs can be um, downloaded or uh, can be downloaded and they can be both human and uh, machine readable. Um, and also that they are uh, pretty permanent, so um, the resources can be available even if the repository is no longer available. For interoperability, this is probably the most complex principle. Um, it essentially means that the research outputs can be interpreted by different individuals, by different platforms, different software, um, and also usually described by um, some, some metadata standards that mean they can be interpreted by different people and um, using standard vocabulary to describe things is also really important here. Uh, and finally, oops, sorry, let me just move my, my bar, it's covering my screen. Uh, so finally, for reusability, um, this essentially means, th this is really the ultimate goal. So it means that given all these principles, research outputs can be um, uh, efficiently and easily reused by other people to, to maximize our benefits that we get from these research outputs. Um, and this also includes things like providing um, appropriate attributions and conditions for reuse. Um, I've also linked to two previous OLS cohort calls that explain a lot of things in more detail. So I highly recommend um, you check these out if you are interested. Um, so why does it matter that we talk about these fair principles or why should we care? I already sort of mentioned that this is really to help maximize the value of all of the outputs of our research. It takes you know, a lot of resources, time, energy, money um, to produce um, data and other types of um, outputs from our research. So it's really important that we maximize the value of their reuse. And this is also in line with generally being good stewards of um, our data in whichever scientific communities we work in. And ultimately this leads to um, promotion of scientific progress and um, hopefully making our world a better place. It's also important to note that um, fairness is not an all or nothing game. It really is a sliding scale um, as illustrated here by this example. And also data and research outputs being fair does not necessarily mean um, or not equal value. So it's possible to have um, data sets that uh, may not meet many of those criteria, but for other reasons, they are of high value to the scientific community that they're relevant for. Although do note that this means that the barriers for accessing the value in that data will be steep in this case. And similarly, there are also data sets that exist that hit all those criteria or most of those criteria, but for other reasons, they might be of low value to their scientific community um, if they aren't being used. So this is just something to keep in mind. As the FAIR principles were initially developed to describe research data and metadata, it's also become clear that they can apply to many different research outputs um, from code and software, publications, um, workflows, so computational workflows or um, experimental workflows and also training materials. So I'm gonna talk a bit more in depth about the data and metadata aspects, but I'll touch upon some of these other concepts um, later as well. Um, so just to give sort of a concrete example from um, my background in genomics and transcriptomics, uh, one way that we can support, especially the interoperability and reusability components of FAIR is to use standard formats for representing, or file formats for representing data. So in the context of 
DNA and other types of sequencing data. This involves using particular fire file formats that are listed here. So FASTQ, BAM, CRAM, et cetera. It's not important that you know these acronyms per se, but just to know that this is a standard specification for how data are represented in, in a file. Um, and similarly, genetic variants are represented by um, a few different standard file formats. Um, and then there are some interesting emerging formats. Um, so these are quite new for representing um, disease and phenotype information. Um, this is called phenopackets. And also um, relevant to the work I do now with sensitive human data, there's an emerging file format for representing encrypted data. Um, and if you want to learn more about this sort of area um, and also relevant for policy around human data sharing, um, there's a really great group um, called the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which is a policy um, and standards uh, setting community um, around the world that's sort of developing these standards. And I've just highlighted a few in the um, blue bolded text that have come out of this group so far. So this is a really great group to follow if this is your, your area of research. Um, in line with that, um, so with my background as a metadata specialist, I just need to make a plug for various metadata standards that are common amongst some of these different research areas um, spanning both genomics, um, proteomics, metabolomics, et cetera. And these are sets of terms that have been identified as being important for describing data coming from these types of experiments, again, supporting um, mostly the interoperable and reusable components of FAIR to make sure that other researchers can reuse this data um, and extract more value from it. Um, so now I'm going to switch into um, talking about some best practices um, for um, supporting FAIR principles. And I'm going to take an example from um, a paper that was published. There's a link here. It's one of these 10 simple rules uh, papers from um, the PLOS publisher. And this one was for annotating sequencing experiments, um, but it actually can apply to really any running any type of experiment. Um, and so the, the suggestions for how to you know, promote FAIR data within it, um, running these experiments starts even before you start collecting data. Um, so um, one of the rules, or one of the first rules is to actually think beyond the initial research question that you're studying and think about how the data might be useful or applicable um, for other people in um, asking potentially related questions. Um, and it's also important to identify a role um, that they've called in this paper a data steward. This is someone who is responsible for following the data through collection during the study, um, but also responsible for how the data will be um, made fair and uh, shared after the experiment is done. Recommendations during the actual data generation steps include, again, following community standards, um, for example, the file format and metadata standards I mentioned, but there might be other standards relevant in your community. Um, following a model for how the metadata are collected and stored, um, using these controlled vocabularies, um, also called ontologies. So these are clearly defined terms with meanings. And, and also it's important, especially with um, human data, to identify if there are any legal requirements for how the data or metadata can or can't be shared. Uh, and there also actually might be requirements based on the funding as well. Uh, finally, this is probably the point at which most people even start to think about fair data or sharing their data. Um, at the publication stage. Um, uh, so this is doing things like quality checks, making data freezes or releases, for example, and identifying you know, where and how your um, data and metadata will be shared and stored. Um, so it's clear here that actually thinking about how to make data and other research outputs fair starts way beyond the publication stage, um, at least following the rec recommendations of this paper. And in addition to starting early, um, I also suggest doing periodic self-assessments. So within all stages of, of doing research, kind of checking in to see where you're at against those different principles. And I've listed here just a few resources that I'm, I'm just personally aware of. There are probably many more. Um, these are kind of checklists in general for you know, checking off um, how you're meeting the different principles and suggestions for how to improve um, if you're maybe lacking one of the, the areas. Um, they're all pretty straightforward to use. And so if this is something, again, that you want to look further into, um, I definitely recommend checking out uh, some of these resources for doing a fair self-assessment. 
And uh, finally, I mentioned that there are a lot of other uh, research outputs that FAIR can apply to, although I focus sort of on the data and metadata for this talk. Um, and again, there's so much I could say about all of these areas, but I wanted to give some sort of pointers to external resources. Um, so if research code and software is something that you're working with, um, definitely check out the FAIR principles for research software. Um, this is another version of these FAIR principles as applied to code and software. Um, there's a link to the paper here. Um, these principles came out, I believe, last year, 2021. Um, and there's um, another paper here towards FAIR principles for research software that I recommend reading. And I think you've even talked in previous um, cohort calls about things like licensing and having readmes and doing version control. These are all really important for um, applying FAIR principles here. Uh, there's also a lot of information about verifying workflows, computational workflows, experimental procedures. Um, there's a paper he linked here. Um, in my field, um, things like Jupyter Notebooks um, are great for making your workflows accessible and reusable. Um, so it's a way to uh, display step-by-step -step in a functional way the steps you took to do a particular computational workflow. So that's um, I recommend looking at that if that's something that sounds like it would be useful. And I also really love this, um, this website, Protocols.io, um, which was originally designed to share experimental workflows. It's kind of like a GitHub, but for experiments, um, but they've expanded out to computational workflows as well. There's version control and commenting. Um, so that's a really fun website to check out. Um, finally, for publications and other types of digital um, resources that maybe don't have a home in a particular data repository. There are many places that these can be um, submitted to get accessions, as I mentioned, so that hits the findability affair. Um, Zenodo and Faculty 1000 Research are, are two that I would check out. And I'm also a huge fan of preprints. Um, so there's some examples here that you could um, uh, do some pre-submission of publications. And then finally, the training materials. Um, there's a whole OLS cohort call I linked to and the for my second slide, um, the recording, um, but there's a lot to think about for verifying training materials. There's also a 10 simple rules paper I linked here with a, a, an associated webinar. Um, and then I'll make a plug for, again, I mentioned I was part of the Galaxy project as a trainer many years ago, um, but the Galaxy Training Network is a great resource for seeing how verifying training materials can be done really well. And then I think the very last point I wanted to make um, so in addition to the FAIR principles for, um, for data and other research outputs, um, there is a, a complementary set of principles called the CARE principles um, that have been published, I think they were published last year as well, um, specifically looking at um, data sharing in the context of indigenous communities um, and making sure that data sharing um, is in line with indigenous worldviews and instead of focusing on sort of the characteristics of the data being fair, this focuses more on considering the people and the purpose behind data collection and data sharing, um, but with the ultimate goal of promoting open data. Um, and there's some links here to their paper and the website if that is relevant to anything that you are working on. Oops. Um, finally, thank you for your time. I'm happy to um, answer any questions and engage in any discussions. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Mallory. This was really, really interesting. There is a lot of resources and links in the um, in the slides, which are linked on the Etherpad, so everyone can go and check. We've been adding some of them uh, on line 63 as well. So now we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, I'll let anyone unmute and speak first, and otherwise I'll go through the questions that are already on the Etherpad. But let's start by anyone. Okay, I'll kick it off with questions from the Etherpad, but please keep dropping them in the chat or or on or on the Etherpad. We are now on line eighty. So the first question is from Yo uh, about uh, the the point that you made, Mallory, that fair is not equal to being valuable and that things that are valuable may not match her criteria and you wanted to know if there are any specific examples that help you realize uh, this distinction um yeah i think 
for the data sets that are fair but of low value, um, sometimes this just means for whatever reason it wasn't maybe an interesting data set or I often sometimes think that older data sets might tend to fall in this category because sometimes it's cheaper nowadays to redo sequencing experiments, even if there's a, a data set that's been published that is described very well. Some research, researchers just have so much money that they just do it themselves. Um, and so maybe it's it's not worth it now to reuse that data, but it's just cheaper to generate the data yourself. Um, and this is a privilege that some groups have. Um, for let's see examples for uh low on the low fare end of the spectrum but of high value these might be data sets that just were very difficult to generate um and so they have value because they they fit a very like niche area of research that people maybe can't maybe they don't have access to the samples anymore or it was really difficult to collect samples and the researchers just didn't really publish them with a lot of maybe rich metadata um, maybe didn't put them in a very accessible place. So it's kind of unfortunate, but sometimes samples are just so rare that it's can't really redo the experiment and you just have to work with sort of what people have decided is good enough to, to publish. Thanks. I actually just want to offer a comment on that because I, I really appreciated seeing that because I think early on when FAIR was getting really popular, everyone's just like, everything has to be FAIR. And if it's not FAIR, it's not good. Um, and actually looking a bit more measured at this with it to my mind is really important. And I remember I used to work with integrated data a whole lot. Um, and so, of course, some has different amounts of fairness than others. And the moment you integrate it, it gets a lot harder to know what's what provenance came from where and which bits are fair and which bits are less fair. But it's still really valuable. And it felt early on, like because it was hard to make it fair, people would say that it was no longer and useful or valuable which I didn't I never really felt was true so being able to recognize that you can't be perfect in everything but you can still be very useful and very important and actually I think it's a really important part of science here I agree <laughs> thanks for the question thank you Yo. I, I have a follow-up question on the etherpad um, actually that I wrote so on the other end of the spectrum when things are really fair but they are not really used um which means then they are not that valuable right um how can do you have any suggestions or recommendations because to make them become more used because maybe it's not that they are not valuable themselves but they have not been publicized uh adequately or even if they are accessible and so on yeah this is a great question um i guess i can just answer for maybe my personal experience that if other people have have experiences I'd be happy to hear as well. Um, sometimes when we um, realize that some data or software or something really isn't being reused, it's really, we take the initiative to promote it by having webinars or hosting training material, uh, training sessions. Um, we even tweet about some things um, because sometimes it's just a, a matter of awareness. Um, so the findability can be tricky. I mean, most people, when they publish data, they just get an accession, they chuck it in a paper and that's it. They don't do anything else with it. But um, I think it is really important to promote our work through various avenues. Um, so Twitter trainings, um, we, the way our team works, we also are involved in lots of different projects. So if we create some material from one project, we'll use that in another project and build upon it. Um, so I guess it's maybe a, a my general answer is uh, we just have to be, we have to promote ourselves and promote our research in different ways um, and really get that out there. I don't know if anyone else on the call has any other experiences with maybe trying to promote their work or. Um, no, make... Thank you, Mallory. That's, I, I do agree with you. Um, from my personal experience, our problem is that these other activities are very difficult to quantify and to actually pay for. Um, in research, in purely research environments. So yeah, they tend to just overburden researchers that are probably already overburdened. Um, so yeah, but yeah, I do agree that um, publicizing the research should be a core part of, of the project. Okay, um, so we have two more questions. Let's 
tackle those and then we uh, need to move on. Um, so there is a question about the starting early. Um, start early, this is great. I know many of us have been exposed to the importance of starting early, but it would be good if you could explain again how we can avoid scooping by starting early, a specific in the field of genomic. Yes, this is this is a great question. And there's probably a lot where we could even talk about the second part of that question about scooping, um, or, you know, fears of being scooped and what that means. Um, but I think we can do all these start early steps still within a protected environment. So it really is about sort of having a data management plan, um, which can be within your lab, within your research group, or even within yourself, you know, having organized files, having a plan for what you will collect before you start collecting it. Um, having spreadsheets as a bioinformatician, I, I don't typically like spreadsheets, but they are very useful for just keeping things organized. Um, and talking with colleagues about um, colleagues that you trust who you know won't scoop you. Um, talking about what you're collecting and if they have any input. Um, talking with your research advisor, with other people in your program, so you can do all this within a in a safe context. Um, and then you have all of that information built up and organized um, at the point where then you start to think about putting together a publication, um, which is the point at which you um, can actually share your data, submit it to a, a repository, get an accession. So there is a lot you can do before you even make your outputs available um, to the larger community. Thank you. Uh, I don't know who wrote this question, so if you want to mute and comment. OK. Then we move on past. I see, uh, Pat, do you want to read uh, out loud or I go? Okay, then I'll, I'll just go from the other part. So Pat is asking, have you found resistance to the use of fair principles and what kind? Yes, great question, Paz. <laughs> um, I should say that um, all of my academic training was in the United States where I had actually never heard about fair principles. It was only until I moved um, to the UK, moved to the sort of European research space that I even heard about the fair principles. So honestly, I'm not, I'm not sure how globally, uh, how, how, what kind of global adoption the fair principles have, um, or if anyone here has maybe heard of them or not heard of them. So I think I currently exist in this space where there is no resistance to fair, but that just might be my circle that I that I live in uh, and live and work in. Um, but I think going back to sort of the first question and what what Yo was saying is, I would say not so much resistance to fair, but understanding that fair isn't the end game. Fair isn't the only thing we care about. It is just one framework through which we can think about how to. Uh, again, maximize the value we can extract from our research outputs. Um, so, and again, some of the fair principles we have to consider in the context of legal requirements for sharing. This is really big with human human DNA data, health, health data. We can't actually make it 100% open. Like there are restrictions and rules. So there may be some legal resistance, um, but there's still ways um, to be fair in some categories uh, to promote data sharing. Um, and just accept that there are some cases where we can't be 100% open and, and that's okay. We can, we kind of just have to do our best. Um, I hope that was a satisfactory answer, Paz. <laughs> yes, that, that's perfect. Um, of course, yeah, we could be talking about this subject for longer, but yeah, let's, um, there will be time to, to discuss, uh, <clears throat> um, sorry, <laughs> um, too early. And uh, yeah, but uh, we want to move on to the quiet reflection exercise that you see in line 83 of the other pack. Um, so unless someone else wants to say something, I yeah, or comment or ask some Mallory something. But before we move to that, we need to, you know, do this um, <laughs> to Mallory. Uh, I'm not seeing. Oh yeah. I'm gonna put this emoji here. <laughs> ah, and the you know, and the red uh, background is uh, fantastic. 
I want a red wall now. That's just, um, that's just the room that I was booked on campus for. It's not intentional. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a, a campus um, room. Um, yeah, like is that is fabric, right? It's not painting, or is it painting? Yeah, it's fabric. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Mallory, and 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 everyone else uh, joining and asking questions. Um, so, so the quiet reflection exercise is a quiet reflection exercise for um, for all of us. And let's uh, let's think about and and write notes if you want for for the later breakout room. Um, about practicing open science. Um, what sort of things uh, between your project can be shared? Why? Um, and what can uh, what shouldn't be shared and why? So let's reflect on that. And you're in, in the case, you're not working on a current project. I mean, uh, like me, apart from all this, like uh, let's think of past experiences as well. So, that's it. Uh, um, we're gonna stop recording now. Move ID. I. Ah, uh, although we remove ID IDs uh, from patients, uh, along with other demographic uh, variables, we are still trying to be very careful um, about what we can, uh, we cannot, what cannot be mapped, um, and linked to the identity of patients. So, um, I mean, all of these comments are, are super, like, I think I, I invited you to read them in, in, but I wanted to ask uh, or to, you know, emphasize the Alden, Alden comments. Uh, Alden is, uh, is the mentee, is, uh, Mallory is the mentor and Alden is mentee. So uh, we have that pair here today and wait. Yeah, um, and um, so she says, uh, for my OLS project, I am thinking about connecting with indigenous, indigenous communities as part of our user feedback from several communities. And it has been great to speak to my mentor, Mallory, uh, and the expert uh, she found about how we cannot assume that openness is the right thing for every community and that we need to approach indigenous communities without a preconceived notion of what is the best way to communicate with them and get their feedback. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if Alden wants to comment or maybe type, uh, uh, but I wanted to ask, like, uh, how are you planning to, to do that? I don't know, if, can I? Do we have time? Yeah, I can comment quickly. Um... My project's in a very hypothetical stage, which is great because it's so good to think these things through before I do any outreach. Um, but I had a really great conversation yesterday um, with the expert Mallory found, and he was, he really just spoke about his framework, which is about centering the most marginalized people. And um, so, you know, there, there are two different aspects, right? There's the logistics of reaching out to these communities, which is something I need to you know, work with the, the project team on. And what, what he pointed out was you can't even assume just because just because someone has an existing relationship that it's a good one or that you can lean on that. And um, so, yeah, it's Roland. Roland. Um, and he um, and spoke about, you know, coming in with examples, like what you think could work based on research, but not saying this is the way we're going to do it or this is what will work. But here's the work I've done to think about what might work. And then I want their input on what they actually want to work. And um, and yeah, so it's it's a, you know, I would love to be, and like I said, there are multiple communities I'm interested in. So some of them are gonna be researchers and either in um, like polar science or conservation. And so, you know, they're probably pretty, obviously digitally savvy kind of in GitHub and things like that. And we wanna have this open process. But with the indigenous communities, it has to start from from really ground level where can't assume they're digitally savvy, can't even assume English, of course. Um, so we spoke a little bit about how to, you know, engage trans someone to translate and, and approaching that. And I mean, there, there's a lot to consider, um, but it's I'm really glad I'm doing this before before any of the work starts. So, yeah. Fantastic. 
My dog is barking nonstop. I think she probably hears uh, people uh, shouting because of the Argentina game, the World Cup. So Argentina is playing against Saudi Arabia. Um, Batul, you might know. And <laughs> so I think there is a noise outside and she's like getting crazy. Anyways, so yeah, that was... Uh, um, that was uh, that was great. Another point, but I'm not going to put it in the, in the other part so we can move on. But uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Alden. Great background, by the way. It's very kind of relaxing to watch that. <laughs> okay, so we move on with uh, Hema. Yes, thank you, Pat. Thanks for facilitating this section. I think there are a ton of comments. I've been already typing some more on the other part. Um, so great, a synchronous discussion. Um, so our next speaker is the SAPTA. He will be talking about preprints, DOIs, and basically everything related to citation. So I think um, we can just kick it on, the SAPTA, if you're ready for it. Yeah, thank you, Kema. <laughs> thank you, Pas, and also you for um, facilitating this event and also for inviting me. Uh, my, the link to my slide is on the chat. I can type it again. So that's the, the slides. Um, and then I will try to share it now. Yeah. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, it's 5.53 p.m. now in Indonesia. So Indonesia has uh, three um, time zone. I live in the Western part of the time zone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good, uh, Good day, wherever you, you are right now. Thank you for uh, attending this cohort call. So this is my slide. The original slide is not like this. I change, I modify slide, slightly the topics of my slides due to the yesterday earthquake that we have in our um, area here in West Java province. So now the, the title is Earthquake, Reprints, and everything in between. And this is the kind of one slider that I made. Uh, actually, I can explain this uh, only, but let's try to give some context to, to uh, this session. So this is me. I'm working as a researcher in geology and hydrogeology. So I work with groundwater mainly. Um, this is my institution, Institute Technology Bandung. And in my, as my project, I also um, support the community by initiating a preprint server of Indonesia. The name is Train Archive, kind of the evolution version of the first version. Uh, released in 2017. Uh, um, this new version of the server released in 2019, right? So a little bit about the earthquake because the theme of uh, my talk here is about um, how we can deliver our message to the uh, audience, yeah, to wider community. Uh, based based on our knowledge that has been written as a, a preprint, yeah, in this case. So the earthquake is here, right? This is the West Java province. Uh, I live uh, around this area, 50 kilometers from the area. It's 5.6 on Richter scale. It's, it's relatively low, but the gap of the hypocenter the point where the earthquake starts is only 11 um, kilometers below the surface, right? Only 11 kilometers, that's very shallow in, in geological terms, right? Yeah, this is the points and I live 
around here, uh, more or less 50 kilometers or so. Yeah, this is where I live. Yeah, you can you can you notice uh, we have IKEA nearby. <laughs> there's no um, uh, there's no problem with the building. I was worried about the big shelf right uh, in a warehouse. So it's it's we don't have that problem here. So it's a very uh, very new, relatively new settlement in the western part of Bandung. So this is Bandung, the, the capital of West Java, just to give you a geographical context. Um, apparently, yesterday's earthquake, the 5.6, uh, it's not the only one. <laughs> so in, in uh, 24 hours, we have this, this many earthquakes. Uh, throughout um, Indonesia and also in our uh, province, because here we have um, what you call it tectonic plates uh, subjected uh, just uh, south of uh, Java Island. Right? So this is the link you can you can see the the points and about the the point of earthquake. The epicenter uh, points. Uh, this is the only best map that we can get right? that's cited and used by all of the media. Right? It's it's data points, but it's not really data points. They're just a selfie of data points. In 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 my opinion, because sorry, because uh, because we we cannot do anything. Uh, on the points, right? Except we have to uh, replot the the point in our own map. Yeah. So this image is not uh, very uh, reusable. It's not reusable. So this is what we have, and cited by the media. So um, so there's no way we can get the data without knowing people working in the area working on the data. So we send email, we make some calls, and then we can get uh, the, the map, yeah, the original map with the points, maybe in shape files, if you work with GIS, familiar with shape files. So the same situation happens in all of other earth hazards that we have here in Indonesia. We have earthquake, we have flood, we have tsunamis, and also several others. Uh, geological hazards. So this is the story of, of my uh, earthquake yesterday. So this is when the earthquake happens. A few minutes after the earthquake happens, we have a rush of uh, newspaper articles, right? Uh, online. And also a newscaster coverage uh, online on YouTube, on a, on a TV stations, right? Um, most of those uh, media coverage um, invites ex experts' opinion, right? But uh, all of those uh, opinions are all based on verbal conversation, right? So it's like a talk show. So we have no text-based material here, no text-based. So no press release, no, no. Uh, some kind of um, writing materials that that connected with the the, the news, right? Aside to the the news that made by the media, right? So if, for instance, if I was the expert that got invited by the media, so I only answer the question of from the 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 broadcaster, and then. Uh, the journalists type the summary of of our conversation, right? But I don't have uh, my own version of my uh, answers, right? And also with a short of uh, sort of uh, a scientific background, yeah. We, I don't have, and because I don't, I do not make those documents, right? So. 
there's no reusable data shared. So the the best map that we have is just a selfie of data points, right? So it it's not searchable online, right? So in my opinion, um, uh, and at this moment, I keep asking the my colleagues, right, in in the WhatsApp group in our campus and also nearby campus that has geological background. I still um, pursuing uh, persuade yeah persuade uh, all of those experts that has been invited with the media to also release their opinion in in text uh, in in form of text material right and then upload it somewhere uh, we can upload it on a, in a blog uh, in a campus blog or also we can upload it into say preprint server so in this case I kind of widen the 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 definition of preprint, right? Um, press release. We we can also make make uh, our our opinion about uh, this hazard in this case earthquake uh, with uh, several references, several dynamic data. If if it's available, we can make that and upload it somewhere so it can be searchable by someone else right so in um later on i also uh, invite all of you to uh, read uh, our new uh, articles here i wrote with a colleague from indonesia and also uh, iratse puebla from uh, asap bayou and this is the link so we kind of propose this so this paper published in maybe three or four months ago but it's really um what you call it really relate, relate to our situation now uh, with the the earthquake so in in our opinion uh, preprints and also other types of documents uh, like press release can be made as a central communication hub right so if uh, someone else invite you and then you can give the the written materials to uh, to them right and also for others people other people that need an explanation about something in this case in this case uh, the earthquake and then they can fi find the our our materials online because it's searchable, because it has a permanent link, right? One of the permanent link, permanent link system is DOI, uh, released by Crossref, right? So how can we um, release something that can be the central, the focal point of the communication, right? So um, it's easier for us to cite uh, the the comments from say uh, an expert right about yesterday earthquake then if we don't have the the written documents whatsoever right um, so this is just a quick look of uh, the situation of our uh, preprint server uh, we still like off social science uh, social science rate of per subject yeah social science is not very uh very big but it's the second biggest preprint in our server the the first one is health health science so in in this case i think uh more social science science social scientists in indonesia more exposed to to preprint server than the other scientists say earth sciences and engineering um i think it's very interesting for me and for our team to to study why because in other uh, part of the world uh, social science might might be in in the second lowest point maybe i i don't know but my feeling kind of say i uh, think think of that right so this is the the situation so um, thank you for listening. Uh, again, I need to point out that 
uh, preprint and also uh, similar uh, unpeer reviewed materials uh, in form of uh, press release, opinions, comments can also be written uh, for uh, our academic record, right? Uh, and put it online so people can search uh, the document other than only listen to our maybe rec recording, our uh, podcast, because it's not really searchable. So we can use uh, general repositories or also preprint server that has a permanent link to make sure that our document can be uh, searchable online. So this is me in Mastodon and Twitter. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Recepta. I think we can give a silent round of applause. Sorry, Mallory, I forgot to ask for this. <laughs> Uh, but thank you so much. I think we are all in love with the uh, selfie of data points concept. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a really good depiction. I think many of us have yeah. found in the ourselves in the same situation. <laughs> um, I'm really sorry to hear about the earthquake in Indonesia. And yeah. I hope um, you and all your friends and family are safe. Yeah. I will open the floor for questions first, and then we'll jump into the Etherpad. So if anyone wants to unmute and ask questions, please feel free. Okay, then we'll I, start. Oh, sorry. I, I was going to type, but maybe, yeah, it's taking me long. Sorry, I didn't have breakfast, so I'm a bit slow. <laughs> I, I often have a big breakfast. So anyways, um, no, the, how is the... How are academic institutions, hmm. um, uh, you know, dealing or responding, or are they welcoming to these efforts of preparedness? And and how is that uh, sort of scenario? Yeah, um, in uh, level of institution, I don't think uh, there there is an inst institution that openly. Uh, publicly announced that they uh, receive or accept the culture of preprinting. But in the individual level, we have many, uh, many activists, right? And also people that send uh, their document, their draft to us. Uh, yeah, I think in, it's still in the individual level, not in institutional level. Us. Thank you, Sata. Yeah, I think you also made a good point of how many of these things are still community-led also when you try to organize to yeah. share these data about the earthquakes. Um, okay, I'll, I'll jump to the third part if there is no more live questions. Um, okay, the next question on the third part is actually for, for me, it's more a curiosity. Um, I was very shocked to learn that it's very difficult to get this kind of earthquake data. Um, mm. Is there any proprietary or security reason behind that, aside from that the data is not well organized or shared? Yeah, I think it's just because, frankly, I think just because they're lazy. <laughs> because um, the technology is very uh, simple right now. Um, just the other day, maybe oh, last week, I also spoke to uh, the authorities in our regency here in West Bandung Regency. Uh, I say to them that this data, we don't have, we always don't have baseline data because we only measure uh, the data now and then it's disappeared, right? And then uh, next year we measure the same data in different situation and it also disappeared. So we don't have a very good time series data. While uh, the technology is very simple because now we can, we have say QGIS cloud, RGIS cloud is very simple just to upload uh, all those um, maps 
to to uh, to the cloud, right? But they they simply don't do it because I don't know. Um, I think it's because the 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 perception, right? So it's like we refuse to share uh, data that don't. Uh, non-sensitive data, even non-sensitive data, we we don't share it because uh, we're afraid uh, of the, what you call it, the sensitive data regulation, right? Although our data is not sensitive, but we only read the regulation about sensitive data and we we read the sanctions, the, the, the problem if we share it. So, so the, the rest of the data uh, will include it as as if they're also sensitive data. <laughs> so we don't split the data uh, very strictly. So it's kind of moving around. Plus, people are lazy. <laughs> well, thank you. I think that's a really really interesting concept that people may be afraid of the consequences yeah, of sharing. Yeah sensitive data even when their data is not sensitive like so, yeah. maybe there is a not a clear separation right and yeah, people yeah. are just afraid i i totally agree that's a that's a very very good point okay um so i think it's time to move on um if there are no more questions please just a second round of applause for the sapta uh thanks for sharing and then i will hand it over to you for the breakout thank you thank you so much Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so we had only two speakers today. We figured that would mean there'll be loads of time for the breakouts. And once again, once again, we've had so much great engagement on the questions and on the reflection. I think we'll get about 15 minutes and a couple minutes report back. Um, so Paz, I reckon maybe one spoken and one written group looking at the size. Um, and what, what the plan was, so we have some very nice uh, questions. Um, if you look on line 133, there is a GitHub repository called Open to Discussion, which is just a set of talk questions that uh, people can use to talk about various different statements or questions around openness um, as, a, as thought prompts for discussion. Um, so what we'll ask is each group spend no more than two minutes deciding on a question. Don't spend all of your time figuring out which question to talk about, which is a possible failure. <laughs> Um, and chat about them. So there's, there's several different sets of questions. I'd recommend using data, uh, open access, open source, or open collaboration. Quickly decide on one uh, and then discuss it as a group, how it pertains maybe to things you're working on or things that you've encountered. And it might be that actually you agree, because um, one thing that we think is very important is that th people think critically about what we should and shouldn't be sharing and why, and that we don't just um, advocate oversharing for example and putting people in danger or putting conservation in danger or whatever it might be um so paz how are those rooms looking uh good so i made only two one written and one spoken that's fine cool sounds okay. good hosts and, and speakers please do go if you can but you don't have to sorry paz yeah i know i was going to say that you choose where where to go like each each person chooses a star right Cool. Are we clear, folks? Got some nods. Cool. Uh, do you want to open them up, Pass? <laughs>